Good evening. Welcome to the Bon Secours Richmond Neuroscience Institute Community Awareness Show. Thank you for joining us today. I am Tiffany Ball, the Neuroscience Coordinator for Bon Secours St. Francis Medical Center in Midlothian, Virginia, and our St. Francis Watkins Center, which is our standalone ED. We're pleased to provide this community awareness show on neuroscience today. We will be taking questions throughout this show. Please call us at 804 915 5202 to talk to our guest. After this show, if you would like additional information, please make sure you check out our website at www.richmond.bonsecour.com or you can certainly contact me at Tiffany underscore Ball, that's B-A-U-L at B-S-H-S-I B -S -H -S -I dot org. Today with us today, I'm sorry, today we, on the show we have our first guest, Dr. Salman Kawaja. Thank you for being here today. He's a graduate of Virginia Military Institute. He received both a Master's of Arts and an Educational Specialist degree from James Madison University. He went on to complete his doctorate in a unique combined integrated program in clinical and school psychology. He completed an internship at Eastern Virginia Medical School and residency fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at Neuropsychological Services of Virginia, Inc., University of Virginia, and the Virginia Commonwealth University. As a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist, Dr. Kawaja provides confidential services, including comprehensive neuropsychological, psychological and educational evaluations. He's a member of our Bon Secours Neurology Clinic. Our next guest is Pamela Champany. She is our Peri Anesthesia Manager at St. Francis Medical Center. Pam received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Virginia Commonwealth University. She received her master's degree in leadership and management from Walden University in Maryland. She has worn several hats at Bon Secours, including nurse educator and administrative director of the emergency and acute care services. Um, she has also received her Six Sigma Green Belt. Thank you for being here with Thank us you today. For me. I'm truly with the group of experts and I look forward to talking with you all today. So first, as we get started, why did you go into your current field? Well, I've always been very interested in human behavior. Um, I've always been interested in what makes people tick and why do people do the things that they do. Um, and after 9-11 happened, I became even more interested um, in human behavior and the consequences of pathology and things of that nature. And I come from a strong family uh, background of medical doctors and things, so I was always interested in learning about the brain, and so neuropsychology just seemed to fit really well with uh, what I wanted to do. Great. Pima? Oh, I'm sorry, what brought you into your current field? Um, the love of taking care of patients, the love of helping patients. Uh, I practice the Bon Secours mission and values of providing excellent care to those in need. Right, thank you. Now, Dr. Kawaja, give us a little more detail about the role of neuropsychology and how, um, what patients can expect from that service. Sure. A neuropsychologist is a clinical psychologist who specializes in what we call brain behavior relationships. In other words, what we look at is how issues going on in the brain can impact our thinking, memory, attention, concentration, mood, general behavior, and right. things like that. So a neuropsychologist fits in with neuroscience because issues like dementia, epilepsy, chronic pain, ADD, ADHD, traumatic brain injuries, and numerous other neurologic conditions can really impact that person's behavior, right. how they think, how they remember things, what their attention and concentration is like, and things like that. Um, so a neuropsychological assessment can help a neurologist or other primary care physician or a psychiatrist better understand how that person's brain is actually working okay. and functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, Pamela, talk to us a little bit about the neurosurgical, and not just neurosurgical, the surgical services offered at St. Francis. Currently at St. Francis Medical Center, we offer many services related to acute and chronic pain patients. We have several orthopedic physicians that provide services to patients with neck and back injuries and issues that they may have for many years. 
I recently started working with Dr. Ashgar in October when his new services opened up at St. Francis. I had the pleasure of meeting him and working with him. And currently, he, um, his practice population consists of patients with chronic pain issues. that have had him for many, many years. Um, the type of procedures we provide there at the hospital are facet blocks. Um, they're usually typically used to help uh, patient better tolerate uh, physical therapy to get them back to their rehab and uh, it helps them with their injury or back conditions. And the type of procedures that Dr. Ashgar does at the hospital currently, uh, he has two phases. A phase that he will bring a patient in to do the facet block to diagnose the cause and the location of the pain. And this also helps provide the pain. And then on the next time, or uh, I think he typically waits like three months for the patient to come back and then he can offer services from that initial diagnosing by using the facet of what type of uh, pattern okay. uh, that he's going to put them through to help them uh, with their pain for the future. Okay, thank you. Dr. Kawaja, as a neuropsychologist, do you treat pain in any sort of way? We do. Oftentimes when people experience chronic pain, we see problems with short-term memory, we see problems with attention, concentration, and focus, and a lot of times there's an emotional component to physical pain. In other words, someone who's hurting all the time must be suffering from some sort of emotional <coughs> response to that chronic pain. In addition to that, pain causes slowing of the brain function. So we can see those cognitive changes like short-term memory problems, difficulty coming up with words, attention and concentration issues that impact the way a person can function both at home, both at work, and with their families. So one of the things that a neuropsychological assessment can do is help pain specialists like Dr. Usker better understand how are these issues impacting that person's day-to-day -day life, meaning how can we transition um, and help that person better respond at work and function better at home and with their families. And a lot of times, if we can reduce that depression, that anxiety that's associated with chronic pain, the pain actually gets better as well. That's really good to know. Thank mm -hmm. you. Now, and a little bit more on that. Um, are there any sorts of assessments that have to be done pre-procedures when a person, before a person maybe gets considered for um, interventional pain procedures? Would you do any assessments before that? Absolutely. There are many times when neurologists or general pain specialists or even psychiatrists and other medical physicians will ask for what's called a psychological evaluation um, that is done on someone who is a candidate uh, for chronic pain management. Um, and that typically includes a clinical interview with me and a variety of different tests based on what that patient is reporting. Okay. You know, are there associated memory problems like we were talking about earlier? Uh, personality characteristics and things like that to make sure that they're an appropriate candidate uh, for pain management, um, for chronic pain management. Okay. Now, I know you talked a little bit about how um, pain can affect your behavior, but can a migraine affect a person's behavior, maybe the stress or anxiety? Um, I'm thinking more along the lines of the worry that comes with migraines. One day you have it, am I going to have it this day? Um, do you do anything to help with manage that? Absolutely. One of the biggest triggers uh, of migraines, there are numerous triggers uh, for migraines, chocolate being one of them, lights being another. Um, and anxiety, stress can also exacerbate or cause migraines to happen or increase in their frequency. And anything that we can do to help someone okay. function better on a day-to-day -day basis and reduce that level of stress um, can reduce the amount of times that they have a migraine or the severity of those migraine headaches. Uh, in addition to that, you mentioned a really good point, and that is people get really concerned. Am I, if I go to work today, am I going to get a migraine? Um, am I going to be able to come home and, and, and make dinner or spend time with my family, or do I need to go up in my bedroom and turn off all the lights and close the drapes and, and stay there for hours at a time? Um, and one of the things that we do is help those patients deal with those particular issues. Um, and what we've found over time um, is that treating the anxiety, treating the, dep uh, d the possible depression and that stress, and at least increasing awareness about the impact that stress has can really in reduce the number of times that they have migraines and more importantly, that frequency, that severity of right. those migraines. Okay, thank you for that information. Mm -hmm. Now, Pam, I know you talked a little bit about the development of the pain clinic at St. Francis. 
how was that team put together? And I know you were instrumental in the development of that, bringing that program to St. Francis. Can you talk to us a little about sure. that? I'd, I'd love to. When I found out originally back in September that Dr. Ashgar was going to come to St. Francis, um, I wanted to be part of it to make sure that the pain clinic worked well, uh, started well, that patients had a great outcome, that uh, the doctor had um, everything he needed to prepare for taking care of these patients. So on October the 19th, we, I, I put together a multidisciplinary team at the hospital. I had pharmacy there, surgical scheduling, our OR nurse supervisor, our, my pre-op nurse, my pre-op supervisors, my OR nurse manager, the administrative director for surgical services, four floor managers. I had everyone there to discuss how can we make this transition to having the pain clinic offered at St. Francis. And, and we wanted it to be a success. We wanted the community to have some place that they could go to to have their chronic pain taken care of. Uh, since October, we had subsequent meetings. We met, we discussed with pharmacy about the different medications, the different procedures that were going to be done there. Um, uh, the doctor and I discussed constantly of new things he may have wanted or needed. Um, and then finally on December 5th, we started seeing our first patients. We saw two patients on that day and, and it's been working well and we're going week to week. Great. And I know those nurses for that team were handpicked as well. Talk to us a little bit about that. They were. A majority of the nurses um, that were picked wanted to be active with pain management. We have a particular nurse um, that, um, let me say his name. Sure. We have a particular nurse, Greg Hargett, that uh, just received his pain certification. And uh, he, was, he has been very active and instrumental in and helping us get this going. I handpicked several other nurses, Kathy Moon, she came from uh, VCU. She had worked with a lot of pain patients. I picked another nurse, Judy Parrish, that had worked with pain patients. Um, Carrie Huff is the nurse that assists Dr. Ashgar in with the procedures along with many others, but they had a love for it, they knew how to take care of patients. They have dealt with the, uh, patients before that had chronic pain, and it just seemed like a natural flow to put them with him and with the patients. And they understood what they were, uh, you know, what they were getting involved in and the care that they were giving. Right. It's great to have a passionate group of people it working is. on that team. It is. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Escar. Oh, hey. Thank you for joining us today. No problem. Dr. Escar, I'd like to introduce him. He is our third guest with us today. Dr. Escar attended the University of Alabama, Birmingham for his undergraduate degree. He received his medical degree from the University of South Alabama College of Medicine, included his neuro neurology residency at the University of South Alabama. Dr. Escar completed a clinical neuro physiology fellowship at the University of Michigan and pain medicine fellowship at the Medical College of Georgia, Georgia Health Sciences University. He's board certified in pain medicine and he is a member of our Bon Secours Neurology Clinic. Welcome. Thanks, Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Um, we're talking about pain and so I have a couple questions I'd like sure. to ask you about that. First, um, does the brain feel pain? So um, the brain technically doesn't feel pain. Pain is perception. So the sensations that we have in our body, pain, you know, pleasant, all that stuff is, is translated in the brain. So the brain decodes the signals that this, the nerves and the spinal cord send to it. The brain tissue itself doesn't sense pain, but um, some of the structures around the brain sense pain and those play a role in headache and migraine, okay. and things like that. Okay. Now, what's the difference between, you know, when a person says they have acute pain, chronic mm. pain, um, neuropathic pain? Okay. So, um, you know, kind of generally speaking, we kind of create, uh, we've created the terms of acute and chronic pain. And to kind of describe those, we, we say that, you know, pain that's within a few, that, that occurs from a, you know, well, it doesn't have to be a specific source, but, you know, pain that kind of lasts a few weeks, maybe four or five weeks, we call that acute pain. And when that changes to 
um, you know, when that kind of spills over into the, you know, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, we start to get into chronic pain. But we generally regard chronic pain as pain that's been going on for at least three months. Okay. And what about the neuropathic? So for neuropathic pain, uh, we believe that's a specific subset of pain that, that's related to um, how, how the nerves would normally transmit pain signals, but uh, uh, there is a different quality to that pain. Okay. okay? It's, it's more of a burning type pain, stabbing type pain, uh, shooting type pain. You know? Okay. Now, after hearing all of that, what type of pain, if a patient, what kind of um, pain should someone conceive for? Well, you know, we, my clinic does all kinds of pain, and, you know, my primary interest is in uh, spine pain. Okay. You know, pain from, you know, chronic pain in the lower back, which is very typical, you know, in the community, uh, to, you know, neck pain, and that, that's also very common. But we, uh, we also treat hip pain, okay. knee pain, shoulder pain. You know. Okay. Thank you. Now, I had a question asked to me as we are getting into the spring season, well, just seasons changing in yeah. general, do people experience um, a change in their pain with that? I think most people, people with arthritic type pains, they, they typically have worse pain or worsening of the pain when, when the weather changes, okay. rainy weather, cold weather. I, I haven't seen the case that they have more pain as the weather gets better. Usually people are happier. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I was um, just online looking at it and I saw a blog where several people were saying, um, I think they were saying in April, and maybe because it was so rainy or something, but yeah, saying they had I a lot of pain. Something to, do with the, something to do with changing the weather, rain, rain a lot. Right. Now what type of medical treatments are available for pain? And when we talk about that, um, even alternative therapies, mm -hmm. exercise, um, diet, does any of yeah. that have an, can that have an impact? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you know, every, it, it all plays a role. I don't think there's any one thing that'll take care of anyone's pain, you know? You know, I think um, we typically try to, uh, you know, encourage people to kind of you know, get a little more active, you know? Okay. So we think physical therapy is helpful. We think kind of general movement is helpful, you know, swimming things like that. Um, you know, and there are medications that can be helpful. Um, there's a lot of non-invasive ways to manage pain. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, stretching, uh, physical therapy. You know, there's different devices that, through therapy, that can help. Um, and then, you know, some anti-inflammatories and, and other pain medications. And then there, there's some other things down the road. Down the road. When, when you kind of come to a pain clinic, we we'll talk to you about those. But. Okay. <laughs> Neil, before I started working in neuroscience, I just thought a headache is a headache. Um, you know, what's the difference, really? Are there um, between, you know, a regular headache, a mm -hmm. migraine headache, and maybe, say, a tension headache or sinus headache? Okay. So, um, you know, most commonly, you know, patients will, I mean, all of us, not just patients, we have, you know, we have headache every now and then, you know? A mild headache, not, not anything that's chronic. We leave right. it alone, treat it with a little over-the-counter medication, and it goes away. Um, you know, then you get into specific headache categories, you know. Uh, tension headache would be a headache that is, you know, uh, could be chronic. It's, it's kind of an all-over tightening pain around the head. Uh, people describe it as vice-like. We find that tension headache has a lot to do with underlying stressors mm -hmm. in people's lives. Um, and so we kind of, you know, kind of always try to inquire about, you know, something going on in your life. Did something changed recently to cause okay. the headache? And then migraine headache is a, you know, a separate category of headaches, and that's typically um, whether it's intermittent or whether it's very frequent, or I mean whether it's chronic or frequent, but um, you know, those are headaches that can be on one side of the head or alternate sides of the head, but those specific headaches tend to be very severe, uh, throbbing, pounding, aching. Um, people get nauseated, people uh, may or may not have vomiting, some light and sound sensitivity. Right. Do, I guess, is the frequency of um, migraines, is it the same between men and women typically, or does one gender experience um, Women typically have more, uh, typically have more headaches than men. That's, that's what we've seen. Okay. Um, unknown why, but that's the case. <laughs> We're stressed. Yeah, probably. <laughs> We're probably stretching out. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. So. Okay. Now, I know we talked about triggers a little bit with Dr. Kawaja, um, but 
are there certain environmental or hormonal triggers? Um, um, environmental triggers is hard to say. I, I don't. I don't really think I could really put a pointer on that. Or, you know, there are some people who say that certain foods trigger their headaches. Caffeine or uh, alcohol triggers a headache. Dark chocolates trigger headaches. I don't know whether that's true for everybody. I think that's individual. Um, in terms of hormonal influences, um, not so much in men, but definitely in women. Okay. Uh, women can have, and you know, whenever we're talking to a woman about her headaches, we probably should inquire, ask, you know, are these headaches, do they happen around your cycle? And then, you know, kind of specifically get into that, you know, do they happen you know, a couple days before, right. It, right when it starts, how many days into the cycle? So that, so that can be a headache pattern we can treat, we, you know, we can give them medication and say, okay, well, you know the headaches start at this time, well, why don't you start taking this medicine a couple days before, okay. and maybe that will prevent or blunt the headache. Okay. Now, do headaches typically begin at a certain age, or is there a certain age range that people should start to, or and I start to wonder about, but is it that they typically begin to happen? Mm. You know, whenever I see a headache patient, I always ask them, so when did you first start having headaches, mm -hmm. right? So um, headaches can start at any age. Pediatric headaches are, you know, I don't think they're well explored, but, you know, there's definitely people out there treating pediatric headache and pediatric migraine for that matter. Wow. Okay. Um, but, you know, headaches can start at any age, and uh, it, it depends on what the triggering factors or what the factors involved are. Okay. Now, Dr. Kawaja, how can headaches affect our behavior? In a lot of different ways. Um, people who experience chronic pains, headaches, uh, chronic headaches being one of, one of those examples, oftentimes show what we call cognitive dulling or what we call a cognitive fog, where their short-term memory is not as acute as it could be. Um, and they can show problems with attention and concentration, focus and things like that. A lot of times patients will come to me and say, I'm noticing that I'm making a lot of little mistakes at work. Um, colleagues are noticing, hey, you know, you didn't do this thing that I asked you to do, or my spouse has told me or asked me about something, and I'll forget what they said, or I might have difficulty coming up with the right word, or I'll forget what, uh, you know, um, what I'm supposed to do today, things like that. And that can really cause a lot of concern, and, and people might wonder, am I losing my mind? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Because these things are happening. Um, and in addition to that, uh, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, when someone is hurting all the time, uh, there's an emotional component to that too. It's not a pleasant experience to be in pain uh, for most people, right. as far as we know. Right. Um, and so there will be a very strong likelihood that there is some depression, that there is some anxiety, there is some adjustment process to that. And you combine those two factors, the changes in someone's thinking and memory and that increased anxiety, it can actually increase the level of pain that somebody experiences, the frequency um, that they're having headaches, for example. Um, and so one of the things that we can do to help neurology and pain management in general is identify those factors and treat those things as well. And that can be one of those non-invasive type techniques that you were talking about mm -hmm. that can reduce how often this stuff happens. Okay, great. And speaking about forgetfulness, I think that gives us a good segue into what I'd like to ask you about Alzheimer's and dementia. Mm -hmm. um, when are there certain symptoms, things should, that people should be looking for with their family members or loved ones? Talk to us a little bit about the different kinds of dementia. Sure, there are a number of different types of dementias. Um, Alzheimer's being one of the more common types. Uh, people can develop dementias for a lot of different reasons and maybe we can start with that. Dementia is simply a term. Um, that describes a change in our thinking, our memory, our attention, or concentration, or other what we call cognitive skill. Um, it could be a language-related issue or something like that, but there's always a short-term memory component. Okay. Now, as we get older, our memories change. Um, nobody in this room has attention or concentration right. as good as it was when we were 18, 19, right. or 20. This is not to age anybody here, right. including <laughs> myself, um, but this is a fact of life. As we get older, things tend to slow down a little bit. But as family members start noticing in an, in an elderly family member or in a spouse, more of that forgetfulness, you know, more of that attention and concentration issues. It's, you know, I'm always losing my keys or I'm always having to repeat myself or forgetting what day it is or I'm having difficulty coming up with words and things. As that stuff starts to happen, that's when um, a family member, a, a patient, or a, a spouse should start asking those types of questions. Do okay. we need to get this uh, evaluated early, uh, or, or get this evaluated or not? 
one of the things that I found is that a lot of times um, the early signs of dementia just look like normal aging. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things, the, one of what I think the most valuable tools that a neuropsychologist has um, is the ability to do testing um, of those short-term memory skills and other cognitive abilities to look at are these changes that are being described, are they normal for someone's age, their education, their gender, the ethnicity, the medications that they're taking, the amount of pain that they may have, um, or are they not normal? And if they are not normal, why is that happening? And most importantly, well, what do we do about it to help? Um, and the earlier that these symptoms are identified and treated, the better off we all are. Uh, there's no cure for dementia, but it is possible to slow down, if not even stop, the progression of that disease. And a lot of that varies on how quickly those, those problems are identified. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. So I want to um, talk a little bit more about our clinic. Um, and Dr. Escar, Pam mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the development of that clinic, but um, what's your vision really for the okay. clinic? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I had hoped to bring to, you know, the Bon Secours system and, you know, the community in general. I, I kind of wanted to, you know, develop a good uh, comprehensive pain clinic um, and with the goal of specifically helping people, well, number one, determining the source of their pain right. and helping mm -hmm. them uh, manage their pain. And, and my specific interest is, is in trying to help patients and their primary care physicians or the, their, their, the physicians that have been treating them, helping them avoid getting on medications okay. forever, right. you know, and I, I think, you know, my, my feeling is let, let's go find the source of your pain right. and let's treat the source of your pain and let's not cover it up with a bunch of pills. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, so I think, you know, um, I think the clinic is coming together well. I think uh, our flow in the, uh, in the outpatient surgery center is coming together well and I'm happy. Good. We are. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard of some phenomenal outcomes. Um, mm -hmm coming from that clinic mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. Pam, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about what you all have been seeing from the nursing sure. aspect. Uh, from the first day, I, you know, I remember the day, December 5th, we started, we had two patients. When the patient first walked in, the, the, our first patient, she had had uh, chronic pain for a long, long time, had seen several physicians. Uh, when she walked in, we asked her what her pain rating was and she said it's a 12. And you probably remember that patient. Yeah. And, you know, by the time she was leaving, um, she said that she felt as if it was a three. Um, and so our pain scales are typically zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain. And she was at a 12 coming in, said she was a three leaving. The nurses were just elated, um, you know, that she felt so well leaving. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, when we followed up the next day, our phone call, because we typically make phone calls on uh, post-op patients and follow-up calls, she was still feeling well. And then uh, the second patient of that day, the same thing. Was it a 10? Was it a 2 walking out? And that, uh, my understanding was, is that was the diagnosing of the first visit was their diagnosing of what type of treatment that they were going to follow up with Dr. Ashgar. So we have had great, personally, the day of and the day after, personally, a lot of great phone calls follow up from the patients. Their, their pain is much less than what it is. And now I think we're starting to see, since we started in December, patients coming back, and now we're going to do the next step in their treatment. Mm -hmm. And I guess that brings up a great point where the goal necessarily isn't always a zero. Right. Um, yeah, no, that's, 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 you know, that's very important that we kind of, you know, that, I think that may be the most important topic in pain management mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, once you develop chronic pain, it, it's very difficult, whether for psychological reasons and physical reasons, right. to mm -hmm. be out of pain. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think as physicians and just providers, we, our goal is to try to you know, try to help the patient get to a level, a pain level that that enables them to function. Right. And right. It, you know, gives them better function, with the understanding that you know this pain may may not go away to a zero, but you know if it drops from a seven to a three or a two, and you're able to get around your house and do things, then I mean I would consider that success. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think mm -hmm. all of us yeah. would yes. agree with that. Yeah. 
I want to remind everyone that if you have questions for our panel, please call us at 804-915-5202. I guess I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of our services we provide at the Watkins Center. Um, would either Dr. Kawash or Dr. Esper give us sort of an overview of what the services are? Okay, sure. So, uh, so the Watkins Center is, is one of our newest locations, kind of, um, uh, I guess, in the Midlothian area. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's it's very interesting kind of concept, I think. it's. It, Usually when you go to the neurologist's office, you have, you know, we order some tests and some of the tests we can do in the office, some we have to send you out for. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a better concept because you come to the neurologist's office, we order, we say, well, you need an EEG test or you need an ultrasound or you need to see the psychologist or you need some imaging tests. Well, we can do it all in one building, wow. you know, and, you know, for patients, I think that seems pretty convenient you know you go to one spot you get your x-rays you get your scans you get your you, you know you get your EEG test you if if you have some memory issues or whatever we send you to the psychologist Dr. Kwaja you get your memory testing and you don't have to run around town doing that mm -hmm. and uh, I mean I think yeah I think it's great from a patient standpoint definitely definitely and how long has the Watkins Center been open? Uh, I think we've been open since uh, October mm -hmm. 5th, okay. Some, sometime in mid, early yes. to mid-October. Right. Okay. And Dr. Kawaja, talk to us a little bit more about some of the services that um, patients can get a referral for to see you. We've talked about um, Alzheimer's and dementia, but what about ADHD or? Sure. Um, the neuropsychology practice at Watkins um, provides a lot of different types of services for a lot of different reasons. Um, our practice here starts at about age, in our f uh, age four and a half uh, and works its way all the way up the age spectrum to, um, we've seen patients 105 and older uh, and just about everyone in between. Um, so in a young child, for example, we're going to look at things like uh, autism spectrum conditions. You know, is there a sign of Asperger's or other pervasive developmental issue? Um, if the child was exposed to any toxic substances or illicit substances during pregnancy, um, you know, is there any evidence that there's any brain damage associated with those things? And uh, early intervention is the key, especially in terms of children. Um, so we do assess for ADD, ADHD, and other cognitive problems like that. In addition to that, we, there's a really strong uh, uh, emphasis in our practice in children with behavioral or conduct disorder pr um, type, type problems. Um, children who may be acting out in, in school or have disciplinary or legal problems. Um, if there is a custody issue going on and there's lots of stress or trauma, um, we see a lot of children who have histories of uh, severe trauma in their lives um, and are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and things like that. Um, and then as uh, the patients get older, uh, we start looking at things more like the ADD, ADHD type stuff, especially in uh, young teens and adolescents. Um, a lot of uh, our folks in the community here play sports. Uh, football and other sports, and so we have uh, associated head injuries, mild right. concussions, um, and there's a question of learning disability if a, uh, if a student is struggling with reading, writing, mathematics, things like that. Um, so sports-related injuries and things like that, and then, of course, as we progress into adulthood, uh, we see a lot of head-injured folks. Um, we see chronic pain um, and general pain-related uh, issues, patients who have those sorts of problems. Um, and also, when someone has a stroke or if someone has epilepsy or they've been diagnosed with a brain tumor, a lot of those things, issues going on in the brain, uh, multiple sclerosis being another example, uh, fibromyalgia even, um, those types of issues can often cause changes in thinking, memory, attention, concentration, and mood. And our job is to assess where are the specific problems, uh, but not only the problems, where, where are those person's strengths as well? Um, because sometimes, like Dr. Esker was talking about, we can't fix everything all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can identify the weaknesses that someone has and also identify the strengths that they have, um, we can sometimes use those to a patient's advantage and say, okay, we might have some short-term memory issues, but we can work on our attention and concentration or you may have difficulty coming up with words, here are some things that we can do about that. Um, and then it, as it progresses older, of course, the dementias type questions and treatment and follow-up, making sure, are the medications effective? Um, right. You know, uh, if someone wants to return to work after an accident or an injury, are they able to do those sorts of things? Um, so we cover a, v a wide variety of, I can tell. of, of that different is. things. Uh -huh. Awesome. Yeah, every day is a different day, that's, <laughs> for, that's for sure.
<laughs> I'm sure. That brings up um, another topic I wanted us to talk a little bit about with sports season about to gear back up, and that's um, concussions and post-concussion syndrome. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think we, um, I think, I think as a nation, I think we're becoming more focused on head injury because right. it's something right. that has been so pervasive, but we've never really thought too much about it. And now we're dealing with, you know, you know the worst outcome of con uh, concussion, which would be in traumatic brain injury. Right. But, um, but, you know, short of that, most people, not most people, some people who have concussions end up having what we call post-concussion syndrome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when a patient comes to me and they say, you know, I was in an accident, I hit my head, and things are, things are not the same, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of go through and talk about, well, you know, what's changed? You know, I, I was asking, you know, how is their mood compared to before, okay. right? Um, you know, patients who have head injury, uh, they, can all, they can develop some, you know, irritability, depression, you know, anxiety, mm -hmm. things they never experienced before. Mm -hmm. You know, we ask about headaches, you know, and patients, unfortunately, will say, well, you know, sometimes I've developed some headaches and I never used to have headaches. Um, and then, you know, in, in kind of along with Dr. Quadra, we kind of, in both of our worlds, it's, uh, you know, well, how is your memory? You know, and that's, mm -hmm. that's to some degree impacted in a lot of those people. Mm -hmm. I try to give them hope and say, hey, listen, you know, you know, from point A, when you have your injury within... My understanding is within a few months, three, four months, people are generally starting to get better. Okay. And I believe by nine months, most people are better. Okay. You know, there's a small percentage who I think linger and continue to have those problems. And and uh, you know, I think trying to get them, you know, trying to get them some medication for symptomatic relief okay. would, right. is, is what we try to do. And if we can guide them towards resources such as a head injury clinic, okay. um, that I think they have. Those types of settings have a structured way of uh, rehab, for that matter. I mean, you can kind of fill in to help me out. Sure. I mean, a lot of times, especially if we're talking about mild traumatic brain injuries, so uh, someone is playing a sport and they get hit in the head and they might not necessarily lose consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they might just feel a little dazed or in a car accident or something like that. Um, and they go to the emergency room and they might have an imaging done, a CT scan done, and a lot of those tests might come back normal, but the patient or the family is saying, no, something's not right. I am not. I'm different, and it could be, like Dr. Oscar was talking about, personality changes especially can happen, um, but also that attention, concentration piece, um, and the short-term memory issues and things like that can develop, and they can be very mild, very subtle, and maybe only the family notices, or maybe only the patient notices, and nobody else around them notices. Um, that's one of the reasons why a neuropsych evaluation can be very, very helpful, because if we can target those areas early um, in someone's recovery from a head injury, we can improve their chances of success. Mm -hmm. And if there are any long-term impacts, uh, we can identify those things early as well and get those steps in place to help accommodate for whatever those, those issues are. Um, a lot of times parents will ask, you know, can my child return to playing sports or can they go back to school full time or, uh, you know, yeah. if they're an adult, may right. I, can I go back to work? Right. You know, the employers are asking, you know, this, this injury did happen. When can I go back? When am I safe to drive? When can I make decisions? When can I do all these sorts of things? Um, and that's where these sorts of evaluations and assessments can be, uh, can be quite helpful. Okay. Great. And I guess just talking about head injury, that segues us into... Um, epilepsy a little bit. Um, this Saturday, March 16th, the Westchester Commons Shamrock 5K will be taking place and Bon Secours is a sponsor of that. At that event, we will be distributing helmets to children, um, to the first, I believe, 100 children that are there. And so why is wearing a helmet so important? I mean, you know, I mean, Depends on what physician you see, but I think the brain is <laughs> most important. Yeah. Right. W without your brain, you're, you're not functioning. Right. You know? so, um, but, you know, I mean, you, we can take small measures to get big benefits. I think, right. you know, wearing a helmet is, not, you know, is, is, is a very easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it protects your head from injury, protects you from, really protecting you from head injury, and that's really important so you don't develop post-concussive syndrome, post-traumatic epilepsy, you know, anything bad like that. So, I mean, very simple to do, and we should all, myself included, think about doing it when we get outside and start to do crazy things. Definitely. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost my place. Oh, that's all right. Okay. 
So we've moved through the gamut of neuroscience a lot today. We've mm -hmm. talked about several neurological disorders, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about my favorite one, which is stroke, which is not my favorite, but it is the leading cause of adult disability. And it's still the fourth leading cause of death in adults. And um, Dr. Asper, could you talk to us a little bit about risk factors, maybe for preventing? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you know, traditional risk factors we talk to patients about or, you know, traditional risk factors would be age, okay, male sex, um, you know, the presence of uh, hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, um, um, you know, uncontrolled blood pressure, you know, certain, using some drugs makes that even worse, right. so we try to avoid those. Uh, and, you know, generally we want patients to get checked out early and managed on their basic medical problems so it doesn't turn into a stroke. Okay. You know, just see your primary doctor, make sure you know, see him annually, see him or her annually, get your blood pressure checked, uh, you know, try, you know, try to keep your weight under control, obesity can impact your blood pressure and everything else, so, so, I mean, those are the kind of common risk factors we think about for stroke. Okay, and what about just basic signs and symptoms, um, just, yeah. to, you know, letting the community know what yeah, should they sure, be looking sure. for? So, most important things, you know, you, you, you want to be sure, the common signs and symptoms of stroke would be uh, you know, numbness of an extremity, weakness of an extremity, you know, when, if people are around you, you know, twist, droopy face, slurred speech, uh, those are the major signs of stroke. And uh, if anyone experiences those, you know, it behooves you to, uh, you know, take, take it seriously. Call, you know, if, if it's not going away within a few minutes, call 911. Right. You know, get somebody to get, pick you up and evaluate you come to the ER, let us check you out. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And one of our acronyms that we use when we're doing community teaching is FAST, and so FAST is fa F mm -hmm. is FACE, like you were discussing. Um, oh. yeah. <laughs> Hello? Hi, my name is Pam, is a nurse, and I wanted to know, did she have any specialty uh, classes that she had to take, and what made her go? Thank you. Thank you. For um, being a perianesthesia nurse, we have a lot of uh, classes that we attend. I'm getting ready to go in April to the ASPAN conference, which is a big conference for perianesthesia nurses. We also have certifications, CAPA and CPAN, that certify us for, um, for our certifications. We have a lot of in-services related to uh, different types of surgeries different type of specialties, orthopedic, neuroscience, pain, uh, that we are, uh, have at the hospital that I attend quite frequently. I'm also part of the hospital stroke team. Um, so I have trained with Pat Lane and Tiffany. Uh, we're recently undergoing uh, bringing up different uh, neurotechnology mm -hmm. that just came up to perianesthesia. All of the nurses are uh, going through that training. So. A perianesthesia nurse has a critical care background. I do have that. I've worked in the emergency room. Um, I was prior military, so I do have that. And um, all of these skills and knowledge uh, from the positions I've been in, I feel has aided me um, in being able to be the perianesthesia manager. Great, thank you thank for you. sharing that. Thanks. Um, And I guess just, I was referring to FAST before we uh, mm -hmm. asked right. uh, the sh um, caller. So F is for face, so any sort of facial droop, facial changes. A is for arm, um, if you have one arm or um, extremity that's weaker than the other. Um, and S is for speech, so a person's having trouble understanding what you're saying or their um, language is different when they are speaking. And <coughs> T is for time, which is what Dr. Escar was referring to. Call 911 mm -hmm. and get to the hospital fast. And as we're beginning to wrap up here, I would just ask our panelists, um, if there was just one thing you know that you'd want to share or leave behind with the community um, from what we've discussed here today, what would that be? And I mean, not necessarily diagnosis, but just a tip or tidbit, just what mm -hmm. would you leave behind? Uh, call 911 if you think you're having a stroke. <laughs> um, 
And also, you know, work with your primary doctor, get your general medical issues under control, and uh, let them guide you to uh, whatever other services or specialists they think you need to see. And, uh, you know, we're out here for you. If you need help, you can give us a call. Mm -hmm. um, I would say uh, keep an eye on yourself and, and keep an eye on your family members. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to help someone. Uh, we talked about memory a lot and, and with attention and concentration and, and cognitive skills. Um, there are a lot of assessment opportunities available um, to better understand the nature of someone's cognitive skills, their thinking, their memory, and their mood. And there is help out there. Um, and a lot of times without these tests, we really don't know what's going on. And we, make it, we can make assumptions and try to treat uh, different symptoms and things here and there. But um, there's help out there. And so just keep an eye out. And if you have a question uh, you know, about a family member or a loved one or yourself uh, in terms of thinking, memory, mood, and things like that, it, 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 there's, it, there's no harm in asking. Um, and we can certainly try and help. I just would like to tell the audience out there that uh, the type of procedures that we have brought to St. Francis with Dr. Ashgar um, has been a great alternative for patients taking oral pain medicines. We have seen a lot of great responses to the treatment and the type of diagnosing and the future treatment of patients after we've diagnosed them. And this totally is helping decrease the use of oral pain, uh, oral narcotics and it does allow them to have immediate relief so that they can take care of themselves, take care of loved ones, and take care of everything that they need to do daily. Um, it's just a great service that we've just started, and I think it's a great service for the community because there are a lot of patients out there with chronic <coughs> pain that do not want to be on oral pain medications for the rest yes. of their life. Mm -hmm. So I say just take care of, uh, of, of your chronic pain. Please come see us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I'll give you that website again. If you go to bonsacor.com or more specifically, if you go to richmond.bonsacor.com, you'll be able to find our neurology clinic services where you can see Dr. Asgard and Dr. Kawaja's services that they provide and have contact information for them as well. Um, and one final question, I guess it might not be my final question, mm -hmm. but it did trigger it when <coughs> we were talking. Ways to keep the brain healthy healthy, um, right. you know, <laughs> as we're talking about all these um, diseases and disorders, but how can a person really continue to challenge their mind? Well, one of the, um, one of the things that I tell almost all of my patients is that it's just so vitally important to stay as mentally, um, physically, and socially active as possible. Um, a lot of times when people are used to high-functioning jobs and they've worked really, really hard their entire lives and then they retire, many people just stop. Um, they stop doing, um, and they're hanging out, uh, watching television, maybe playing some golf or do, doing this, that, or the other, but they're not exercising that brain the way that they are so used to for 60, 65 years of their life. Um, and a lot of times we'll see some cognitive decline because of that in inactivity or that inactivity exacerbates those problems. Wow. So mental exercise, mental energy is, is just such an important thing uh, to do. You know, when we're at rest, our brain uses more sugar than, what, any other organ yeah. in the body, right? And we, and we need to use that. And so it can be simple things like crossword puzzles. You know, Sudoku is the big thing now. Jigsaw puzzles, even going through old photo albums and, you know, naming all the people in the pictures. Right. You know, spending time with family, friends. Uh, you know, Dr. Oscar talked about the, the importance of physical activity and exercise to reduce those risk factors for strokes. So I think really it's those three things, mental activity, physical activity, and, and social activity. And I always advise patients at least an hour a day. Spend an hour doing the crossword puzzles, uh, you know, reading the newspaper, watching the news, talking about social issues or things that are going on, um, and to try not to just be so kind of sedentary all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to ask, do you recommend herbals? Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I ginkgo. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people take ginkgo, uh, ginkgo mm -hmm. biloba. There are other things that um, people take uh, to improve, improve mood. Um, there's St. John's wort that people do for mm -hmm. that. You know, uh, I think when it comes to the research in terms of efficacy, it's hard to say okay. uh, the the effectiveness of those things. But I, I don't think that it can hurt. Okay. Um, and I certainly think that people who take those types of supplements tend to live a healthier lifestyle, also, um, and tend to be more active in those ways. So I. I I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't know if Dr. Esther, you have a different opinion. Yeah. I'll I see start no taking it then. I think I, think <laughs> I take Inco sometimes. So. <laughs> and I think it's just important um, before you're taking any herbal remedies, talk to your primary exactly. care providers, Dr. Right. Esther was saying, just to make sure that it doesn't interfere with if you are on a um, medic other medication. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. 
But did you have anything to add to that, Dr. Escar? No, I mean, I think Dr. Crowder pretty much summarized it well. And, you know, I mean, <clears throat> you know, like he's saying, your brain is a, you know, in the general sense, your brain is a muscle. You don't, right. if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, so, you know, stay mentally engaged, get out there, be active, talk mm -hmm. to people, keep an active life. Um, the only thing else I could add is maybe do a little dancing, maybe that <laughs> <laughs> get your brain going a little. <laughs> Muscles moving. Yeah. Sounds good. I don't think any of us would mind doing a little of that. Um, uh, don't ask me to dance. Yeah, okay. that's what, that was my next question. <laughs> going to tell them to cue the music. Um, as far as our upcoming shows that we'll be having, um, Diabetes Management and Healthy Eating, March is National Nutrition Month, and so we want to feature some healthy recipes and um, show you some different and creative ways that you can incorporate some vegetables into your diet. Um, and I want to let you all know about our Get to Goal program. I think you all have heard about that as well. Get to Goal is our program that um, Bonsacor is partnering with the American Heart Association on. And it's a hypertension awareness program. What we want people to do is just know their numbers, know where your blood pressure is at, and know if you are in um, a normal blood pressure range, prehypertension, um, or if you are um, hypertensive and get you talking to your healthcare provider and get you looking at lifestyle changes that maybe you can make, whether that's diet or exercise, um, eating better, and all of those things. Any final thoughts or? Um, well, no, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think as a, as a general, uh, kind of general statement, we're, we're, you know, we're here to help. I think, I, I think the neurology and neuroscience clinic has a lot to offer patients. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we'd love to be able to kind of help you understand what, what, you know, where you're having trouble and, and if we can try to make your life a little better, a little more active, enjoyable, I think that's, that's you know, something we'd enjoy helping you with. Definitely. All right. Yeah. Huh. I'd say now would be a great time to call if anyone has yeah. any questions or yeah. concerns. Call or if you have any yeah. questions for our panel. That number is 804-915-5202. Um, I can always ask a couple more questions. Sure. Um, when we're talking, when you're talking about children and teenagers being diagnosed with um, ADHD or ADD, Sometimes you hear people say, well, it's not necessarily that, but maybe they aren't challenged. I mean, how do, challenged enough, how do you assess for those differences? Absolutely. One of, one of the things about ADD and ADHD diagnoses is that a lot of times um, a child will be put on some medication um, simply because the parent took the child to, the, to their family doctor or pediatrician or whomever and said, you know, my child is having difficulty paying attention. They're, they can't focus. They can't concentrate. Um, or they're a little impulsive or I can't control them or they're acting out or whatever the symptoms are. Right. And sometimes they'll just be handed a pill and say, here, try this. And in my experience, I've found um, that most children uh, who are taking medication for ADD or ADHD have never gotten tested, okay. um, never actually had the right. tests done that are measuring that brain's development and that brain's function. Okay. So a lot of times parents will talk to me and they'll say, you know, I've heard all these horror stories about Ritalin, about Adderall. You know, it made my child, it made my neighbor's child into a zombie. It caused them to lose their appetite. It caused suicidal thoughts and all these things. And one of the first questions I asked is, well, did they even get, did they get tested? Okay. And nine times out of 10, the answer is no. So fundamentally, that's one of my biggest concerns too, is that ADD and ADHD and issues like that are almost overdiagnosed, and they're diagnosed based on not doing the tests, but based on, okay, a teacher is concerned or a parent is concerned. And that doesn't mean that their concerns are not valid, right. but those concerns are part of a larger assessment process that needs right. to be done. So what we found in our clinic, when we're treating um, children and adolescents with ADD and ADHD, we're not seeing those side effects. Um, in children who have it. And a lot of times I will see children who are already on medications will do the tests when they're not taking it and I'll say they don't need it. It's something else. Um, a lot of times it can be a depression issue. Uh, it can be an anxiety issue. Uh, parents have split up or there's some sibling rivalry going on or sometimes you know this, the child is just not that interested in school. Uh, you know sometimes boys will be boys and they just want to go outside and play or you know girls will be girls and they want to uh, do their thing also and sometimes maybe that's not the issue. Uh, maybe there's something else going on and, and I think 
uh, we were talking earlier about wanting people to be on less meds. You know, I'm not a big medication pusher uh, when it comes to children with ADD, ADHD issues. We want to look at anything else we can possibly do and better understand what are causing these so-called problem behaviors because a lot of times it's not a problem at all. But when it is, that's where medication treatment sometimes can be very, very effective in conjunction with other things. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. You know, there's motivation pieces, there's mood pieces, there's, there's lots of things that are happening. Um, and so what I'd like to see is a lot less children on medication right. um, and on such high doses of medications uh, and instead better understanding, well, is there a, is there really a problem going on or not? Right. And if we can understand that, we can really, really improve how people and, and children function. Along those lines with children and adolescents, um, those brains are still developing. Okay. And we're talking about adding uh, chemicals uh, to that brain that's still developing, and that could have potential lifelong effects. Um, so you don't want to introduce a medication into a developing brain if that child or adolescent doesn't okay. need it. Okay. And on the flip side of that, you do want to do that. Because at that point in time with a child or an adolescent, you can address those issues young, allow the brain to kind of figure out how to do that on its own, so then it's not a lifelong problem. Okay. So like I was saying, e either way it's a win-win situation uh, to get the testing done because we'll know the answer to those questions right. and if we can understand those questions then we can figure out what to do about it. Right, so the key right. is really just to get that assessment <coughs> right first. Okay. Right, so I would advise <coughs> parents out there uh, to talk to your primary care physician. Hey, do, do you think my child might need to be tested if they have these symptoms? Or you know, ask questions about what are potential side effects or does my child really need this? Because when they need it, it can be very, very helpful. Um, and if they don't need it, it can be very harmful. Um, right. So that's just something to be thinking about. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you for sharing sure. that. Um. So, so I was kind of in the last few minutes wondering, you know, I, I have a sense that uh, when I see a lot of the, my pain patients, I, I feel like, you know, there is a cognitive aspect to their pain. And, sure. I, and I generally recommend or, uh, that they have some, uh, you know, consultation with a neuropsychologist and, and you know, and I, I don't know the correct way to describe it to them, but I'd say that they need maybe to explore some cognitive behavioral management. Sure. Is, is, that, is that the appropriate? Ab absolutely. If, if we can identify those types of issues, and there are like the short-term memory problems, or you were talking about stroke, a lot of times people have difficulty coming up with words. If the stroke's right. on the right side of the brain, we have a lot of those cognitive, high-level cognitive functioning impairments. There is... Uh, there are a variety of treatment options available. There are, there are great hubs in town um, that do great services in terms of cognitive rehabilitation to work on building those skills back up. Um, and that can be a very, very vital part uh, of treatment. We do that with children and adolescents on the ADD, ADHD piece also, as well as children and adolescents with head injuries, um, sports-related concussions or other concussions. Uh, that cognitive rehabilitation portion can be very, very important. Thank you all. Thank you so much for being on our Thanks show today. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you all for joining us today on our show of um, really ended up being a little bit of neuroscience overall. So we hope you enjoyed um, seeing that today. And please, if you have any questions, you can contact me at Tiffany, T-I-F-F-A-N-Y underscore B-A-U-L at B-S-H-S-I dot org. I'll be happy to get your questions answered. And again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.